This is Eat, Sleep, Invest, the marketing podcast for real estate investors to get more deals. So now let's talk about, okay, so I know a lot of guys flipping houses, wholesaling houses, things like that. And I don't know many guys doing multis. Yeah. So what, where's the right disconnect or where's the bridge there that the guy's doing single family, like me, myself, I buy, I buy singles, I rent them long term. Yes. At, yes. Where, where's the bridge to get into the multis? We got to read like that. The, the, the bridge is that you are not beholden to a big group of investors when you buy a single family home. You're probably doing it with your own money. You're doing it with Burr strategy where you're buying a theater, uh, maybe throwing some hard money or some private lending money in there, fixing it up, increasing the value by getting a tenant in there, and you know, a, a unta- un- untangling the knot, if you will, and getting the property well performing and then refining it to get your money back and do it over and over and over again, right? I know I got a lot of money that did that. And I, I was, a, uh, we had, at one point, Brian, we had 115 units in Trenton, New Jersey, my wife and I did, and we ran the property management company ourselves. And it was all scattered site, like you got, you know, like you're talking about there. And it, and it was a good living, but we ended up having more and more private investors show up to us that said, hey, we see what you're doing. We want to be a part of it. Because I had let a few people in as equity investors into my deals. And then they told their friends about it. They told their friends about it. So, at some point, Brian, the snowball started to get bigger and bigger for private equity that wanted to invest with me. And so I knew like, okay, I could be that guy and go out there and buy like three, four or 500 units worth of scattered site single family homes and build a management arm around it. But I decided it'd be easier. It would give me less agita the, the, to just go buy slightly larger apartment buildings with that money and then scale up and scale up and scale up. Because I realized, as I said, the bigger you get, the more site staff and the more that property can afford. So it was really, I think Ryan, two private investors that we ended up getting in a multi, not that one, not that one's better or not, but we're able to take down deals that are way larger than what we could afford with our own cash or that our investors could afford by themselves. So we get a group of investors together. And with that group buy properties that none of us could buy on our own. Uh, but we do, you know, deals that are like whatever's beyond the big deal card, like the, the, the card above that, where you get a big group together to get into. Yeah, almost, it's almost like selling stock at a company. And that's the way we set it up. So it's way more complex than single family owns, uh, but it's a different strategy. And that's probably why, because the strategy is completely different. Right now, so if someone wanted to start getting into that that area, say they had the money, like they had some guys who wanted to, they, they thought they had the private money. So the money part that, solved. How mm-hmm. do they get into, like, what do you recommend? Well, Okay, they should check out my book, Raising Private Capital. And let's say a flipper is listening to this right now and they've been able to get private money from their Uncle John and from their dad or from the guy they go to church with or from the next door neighbor. Those people are all those that private lend through their IRAs or through cash or whatever that keep that flipper going, right? But when the flipper could say, hey, next door neighbor, or hey, you know, Joey that I go to church with, wouldn't you love, I'm, I'm paying you 9% on your money right now. Wouldn't you love to get a little bit of a ride along if I did a rental deal and bought that 10 unit apartment building across town, right? Wouldn't you, wouldn't it be great if you got some of the upside that that property has and, or maybe a percentage of cash flow every month, or wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to move your money around every time I sell my fix and flip or refinance out your money out of my single family home that you were in too short term so I can get in a cheaper bank debt. Wouldn't it be great if you... If you're able to stay in there as long as you want, right? So they get upside equity and they get the tax benefit that come along with being a passive investor. Um, I mean, you know, fix and flip investors and private lenders have a major tax problem, um, which owning long-term rentals solves that problem. Um, and that's, that's really the why on, on why they would do it. And then they then they get some res- residual passive cash flow and not have to run. And, you know, they keep, keep doing the flips that maybe a, Flip, flip, buy a rental. Flip, 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 buy a rental. Or, and, you know, buy an apartment building with some of the money that you, that you made on those flips. Yeah, so what, so let's look at the first thing. So to get, to find the deals on multis, that, that, cause I deal with all single family, like motivated sellers. Yeah. Finding uh, people that are multis, it's a different demographic. They're usually yeah. not selling distressed properties. Yeah. Like, how are you guys finding them? Or what do you, what, what do you recommend there? So like 85% of multifamilies that are for sale are sold by brokers. Um, they, 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 and even the, and the sizable ones, forget it. You might, now, interestingly enough, 
you may find distressed sellers on the small side. There's a lot of baby boomer age mom and pop that are aging out of building multifamily and would love someone to approach them with a solution. These are people that have been living on the, on, like you, you got mom and pop that own a hundred unit apartment building. That building could, produ- could, could be producing 80, 90 grand top line revenue minus expenses. And, and if the, you know, if, if one of them is, is, you know, maintaining the property physically, the other one is collecting rents and doing lease showing, they can make a really good living off of that property. And the, the problem they have, right, is they can't sell because that's their income stream. That, that's like, well, I can't quit my job because then I, I'm not, you know, where am I going to, where am I going to go now? Right. So a savvy buyer could approach them and present a, uh, you know, I, either a, 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 um, a loan assumption, you, you know, like a sub, like a sub two buy, or they could approach them with a seller financing uh, offer because that mom and pop may own it free and clear. Right. So there, there maybe is some distress. It may not distress because that distress is what to do. And they're going to keep owning this property until they until they can't physically do it anymore. So that's maybe one angle you can go with. But the ones that we've seen mostly are for sale by real estate brokers, like they're the big time you know folks that are out there. And you can see those by just going on LoopNet. That that's like the MLS of uh, commercial real estate. LoopNet.com. All right, cool. So then basically you got to get good relationships with these brokers too to try to get pocket listings, things popping up. Yeah, it's not the same broker. It's not the broker. The broker that sold that sells you a duplex or sells you a single family home is not the same broker that's going to sell you a 30 year apartment. They probably know each other, but it's not the same broker. It's a, it's a commercial. You need to talk to a commercial real estate. Yeah, it's a good tip there. Yeah. Um, so when, now when you're looking at multis, will you buy multis? that also have commercial with them or are you sticking strictly with the multi-residential i got a few i, I got a few that have like stores that benefit the tenants but it is not i used to when i was a tread landlord that's where we started i mean i had all kinds of, I, had, I had multiple barber shop going to barber shops i had uh uh all kinds of different stores on, on the first floor of our uh, of our properties because what you tend to have it have in small five six unit um multi-family properties in, in urban city is you have storefront, something that serves the community around it, right? So we owned a lot of those back in the day. Now I've got a few that have uh, stores, you know, like maybe I, I got a 166 unit, six of which are stores, 160 year apartment. Okay, so primarily stick with the residential. It's mostly, it's just the way the buildings are built. It's not that that's what I we look we look for. It's just the buildings typically built that way. These are like larger communities that we're looking at now. Now, when looking at numbers, so, so say I'm buying a single family house and I'm doing it for long term, I'm usually looking for it to generate at least 1.5% rent of the purchase price. It's an yeah. easy math for me. I can pick real easy. Now on uh, commercial and uh, multis, what numbers are you guys looking at to be able to tell quickly, like if it makes sense or not? Because there's a lot of different moving parts there. Yes. It, I, it's not going to be 1.5. It's that it, it, we end up buying a good bit less than that probably... Like we've done deals at like 0.7, 0.8 um, percent of rent, um, the percent of, of uh, purchase price in a, in a monthly revenue. But the reason that we can get away with that, Brian, is that everything scales down, right? Um, like what are, well, what's the typical real estate taxes in dollars per door in your market? Uh, I know like a $150,000 place, I'm paying like four or five grand. <laughs> <laughs>